Well, it's a, one of the stranger uh, conversational quirks to say that somebody needs no introduction right before you proceed to introduce them. So I'm not going to introduce Adam. I'm going to welcome him back. Um, and as many of you know, uh, Adam was a graduate student here in the 90s. Uh, he actually got his undergraduate degree at MIT, so uh, just, a lot, just across the way. After he uh, got his degree, he went to Berkeley as a Miller Fellow and then to Space Telescope. Um, and finally, uh, more recently, to Johns Hopkins University, where he's now the uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Pro Professor, the Thomas J. Barber Professor in Space Sciences, and the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Physics and Astronomy. So <laughs> Johns Hopkins likes him very much. <laughs> I did not memorize that. Um, I think it is really the case that, that uh, nobody in the audience uh, uh, needs to be told about Adam's uh, great contributions uh, in cosmology with the discovery of dark energy. Um, and of course, he's been very well recognized uh, for that. Uh, he actually received the Trumpler Award back in 1999, the Warner Prize in 2003, the Shaw Prize, the Gruber Prize, uh, the Nobel Prize, and most recently, the Breakthrough Prize. So uh, with that, I'd like to very much welcome Adam uh, to the stage to tell us about uh, his most recent measurements of the Hubble constant. Uh, thank you very much. It, can you hear me okay? Uh, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be back. Uh, so, so many things have changed, but many things have not changed as well. Uh, I remember 20 years ago being a graduate student here and sitting in this same auditorium, generally not understanding something that something was being explained. So I always appreciated uh, when a colloquium speaker gave a kind of introduction to the subject. Um, so if you'll bear with me, I plan to start back at the beginning a little bit, but I'll try to move along pretty quickly after that. So I'm going to tell you about a new measurement of the Hubble constant based on observations of Cepheids, supernovae, and parallax. And toward the end, I'll uh, explain how I think this can be pushed to about a 1% measurement of the Hubble constant, which, which would really be fantastic if we can get there. And uh, for any students who want to kind of follow more of the specific details. Uh, most of what I'll be covering was in this paper that we published last year on these results. Okay, uh, one of the few ways we can learn about the composition, age, and fate of the universe is by measuring very carefully how fast it expands both today and in the past. Uh, by understanding that the universe is mostly homogeneous and isotropic, and that general relativity holds, we can derive an equation of motion for the universe, known as the Friedman equation, it's in the lower right over here, that describes how the scale factor A scales with time, how it changes with time, in response to sources and sinks on the right-hand side of the Friedman equation, the components of the universe and their physics. So since we're terribly interested in these components, we would like to go out and measure this function A of t to learn all these things about the universe. Now, we don't directly measure A, but we measure a relation to its inverse uh, redshift. We don't directly measure time, but we measure distance, and that gives us, through light travel time, a connection. So uh, astronomers actually then measure uh, what's called the Hubble diagram, the distance versus redshift relation that you see here, and they can measure it over a range of distances to explore how uh, that A of T function really has been changing with time. Now, uh, it used to be that cosmology was simpler back when I was in graduate school. Uh, we thought the universe was matter dominated. And in a universe like that, uh, you really only need to measure about two derivatives of A to learn most of what our questions were uh, at that time. The first derivative of A is called the Hubble constant, and that sets the scale for the universe. Do we live in uh, an old universe or a young universe, a large or small universe, one that's expanding quickly or not very quickly? And uh, in the mid-1990s, when I was in grad school here, uh, the uncertainty range was very large, embarrassingly large, uh, almost a factor of two. Um, but that improved, and I'm going to talk about more uh, such improvements later. 
Now, the other term, the second derivative of A, is called the deceleration parameter. Uh, we expected this term to be positive because, again, in a matter-dominated universe, the gravitational attraction or breaking uh, after the Big Bang ought to have been slowing the expansion. And so we thought by measuring the amount of deceleration, that would be telling us essentially what the mass density was of the universe. Further, that tells you what the fate of the universe is, and it also allows you to check a prediction of inflation, that that uh, total omega matter would be close to one. Um, now, people had these ideas for decades. What was special in the 1990s was that it became possible to measure these quantities to much better precision uh, and accuracy than it was before, and this was through the construction of modern observations of type 1a supernova, the modern uh, Hubble diagram. Now, I'm going to be discussing two kinds of standard candles in this talk. Both are based on stars. The type 1a supernovae, which we believe still to be carbon, oxygen, white dwarfs, which are near the Chandrasekhar limit in a binary, so mass is transferred over somehow or other. The details of this are still a little murky, but we think somehow it, it approaches uh, the Chandrasekhar limit and explodes. It gives us a fairly regular explosion, which is as bright as 4 billion solar luminosities. And then uh, a less bright standard candle, but still very useful, are Cepheids. These are pulsating supergiant stars, uh, about 100,000 solar luminosities, uh, of course, discovered in this building uh, their importance uh, many years ago, Henrietta Leavitt and others, uh, that the uh, frequency, the period of pulsation uh, is uh, used to tune the luminosity of the star. Now, interestingly, uh, type 1a supernovae ended up in a similar uh, way as Cepheids, that the time scale of the explosion, in this case, the breadth of the light curve, also, uh, by the early 1990s, was indicating that uh, some type 1a supernovae uh, were brighter and were, uh, had uh, broader light curves. Some were uh, fainter and had narrower light curves. Um, 1991 was sort of a watershed year for this because there were two of the most extreme examples uh, of either end. Um, and so it became clear not all type 1a supernovae were the same, but by measuring the same kind of timescale information, you could correct them. Also, while I was in, here in grad school, we worked on um, another aspect that required some corrections, that when we see these standard candles, uh, type 1a supernovae, in galaxies through dust, uh, we can measure the amount of reddening if we understood what color they were supposed to be and correct for that as well. So uh, this sort of uh, initial work on understanding how to use these as better, better distance indicators then uh, was very helpful when it came time to actually use them as distance indicators. So in the mid-1990s, the first couple of uh, data sets became available to uh, measure the Hubble diagram of type 1a supernovae. Probably the most important of these was the Kalan Tololo survey done in the south uh, where they found these supernovae and followed them but also the first of the CFA surveys, as in here, from Bob Kirshner's group, this was part of my thesis, uh, was to use the 1.2 meter telescope and uh, uh, get tremendous help from people, many who are still in the audience, to make observations of the supernovae nightly so that we could measure their light curve. So this was the first large collection of objects in the north, was a nice complement to the ones in the south, and demonstrated that uh, type 1a supernovae could give very good distances to about 6% uncertainty to give you relative distance measures. Um, now, the problem of calibrating the true luminosity of a type 1a supernova to determine the Hubble constant was still a hard one. And in fact, even though we could measure individual distances to about 6%, at this time, it was still only possible to calibrate them uh, in an absolute sense, all of them, to about 10 or 15%. I will say more about that later. However, it didn't stop two teams from ignoring the problem of absolute calibration and continue to use these as relative distance indicators to go after that second derivative, the deceleration parameter. And so two teams, one with a large component here at Harvard, uh, the high supernova team, and another, the Supernova Cosmology Project, collected supernovae using four meter class telescopes and sometimes the Hubble Space Telescope at redshift 0.5 and found something, as you know, quite remarkable, that the universe was not decelerating. The supernovae indicated that it was accelerating, that they were fainter than we would have expected if it were decelerating. So this was a tremendous surprise. Uh, however, 
Even at the time, we worried, could there be some kind of dimming effect? We were missing something. Uh, the supernovae were being born dimmer in the past, or there was some kind of gray dust we hadn't accounted for. And so there was a great desire to make measurements at even higher redshifts, where you could discriminate between the continuance of that kind of astrophysical systematic and the natural cosmological result from the model, which is when the universe uh, at, was at high redshift, it was uh, denser and objects were closer together and the universe would have been decelerating. And so over the next decade, a number of supernova projects were done. At the Center for Astrophysics here, there was a number of additional nearby surveys, CFA-2, CFA-3, CFA-4, uh, Sarab Jha, uh, Malcolm Hicken, Pete Chalice, um, and others contributed to these, while at the same time improving statistics, while at the same time going to higher redshifts to uh, look for this turnover. And so by about the present time, this is now a well-populated Hubble diagram at many different redshifts. This is some 1,300 type 1A supernovae. I want to really highlight, uh, even aside from the CFA1 survey that we did early on, CFA2, 3, and 4 are in pink. And if you look in pink, you see a lot of pink at low redshift. And so this is really an important anchor for these kinds of measurements. Uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, I led... Uh, project called the Higher Z team to find these very rare type 1A supernovae at redshift one and a half or so where we could clearly see this turnover uh, and indicated to us uh, that the universe really was accelerating now and we were not being fooled by some astrophysical effect. Of course, in addition, cosmic microwave background observations, baryon acoustic observations, um, uh, uh, baryon acoustic oscillation observations. Uh, some lensing, some clusters, all put together a coherent picture that indeed we lived in a universe that was largely dominated by dark energy. So this, of course, raises the most interesting question is, is the why. Why is the universe accelerating? We can look at the Friedman equation and, and recognize, okay, there needs to be another term that represents this, uh, some kind of fluid uh, with uh, unknown equation of state. If it's less than minus a third, then in general relativity, you will get repulsive gravity. Um, but what is this fluid? What is this stuff? And we don't, we don't really know. Um, but our best guess is still, uh, it's been this way a while, are that it's something related to the particle physicist vacuum energy, the sum of all virtual states. Uh, we've seen other manifestations of the particle physicists' dark energy. The Higgs field is one of those. Um, the test of this would be to see that the equation of state has always been minus one because this would be a static property of space. Another possibility is a dynamical dark energy that we're now dominated by the potential energy of a scalar field. And so when you're dominated by the potential energy of a scalar field, like inflation, you will get uh, uh, an experience, a ride, just like you do with vacuum energy, except the difference is you expect uh, at some point through slow roll, we will get out of that, that it isn't just potential energy, there's kinetic energy too, in which case the equation of state won't be exactly minus one, or we will be able to see it changing. Um, a third possibility is we finally gone and broke general relativity, that uh, uh, we've looked at the largest scales, the horizon scale, and this is a regime where general relativity was not tested before, and what we're seeing is evidence of a failure there. Uh, if that's the case, if there was a scale-dependent flaw in general relativity as A approaches one, then we might hope to see by measuring uh, the equation of state separately at different scales, at the scale of the whole universe, H of Z, or the scale on which structure grows, G of Z, we would see different answers. We would see this indication that there is not one dark energy, but rather there is a scale-dependent problem. So um, given the situation, uh, and the data, of course, still fairly coarse, fairly dull, the way the game has changed, the way we think to proceed, is to take the first as our sort of guess. It's the easiest to calculate. We can make very exact predictions because it really doesn't have any uh, free parameters in it. And then look for departures from plain vanilla lambda CDM, a, a flat universe uh, that has a cosmological constant and do very stringent tests to look for those departures. So I'm going to tell you about one of those tests, which I call the ultimate end-to-end -end test of the universe, because it literally is from end-to-end -end of the universe. Um, we, we start out with this new standard model of cosmology, and we know the percentages of these different components 
through features in the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. Now, we don't know a lot about the physics of dark matter and dark energy, but we make some naive guesses about these. We can, for dark matter, assume it is perfectly collisionless, perfectly cold, perfectly stable. Uh, for dark energy, we'll assume uh, that it is the cosmological constant, despite this 120 order magnitude gap between the particle physics uh, cosmological constant in ours, um, we will assume the universe isn't just close to flat, it's exactly flat. Uh, we'll assume there will only be three neutrinos, the ones we already know about, that there won't be any others. And from these, from basic physics, you can then calculate what the sound horizon is, the, the, the distance sound can travel at the time of last scattering uh, of the cosmic microwave background. You can then observe uh, the Doppler peaks, uh, that is, you're observing the sound horizon, and when you observe the angular size of that and know what its true size should be, you've determined the distance to the cosmic microwave background, to the last scattering. And that distance is good to about 0.4%. It's really remarkable. This is actually the best distance we know outside uh, the local solar neighborhood. Um, you can then take that same model with those same assumptions about it, and propagate forward in time through the Friedman equation how the expansion rate of the universe measured uh, at last scattering, when we know the redshift and the distance, will uh, be today at the current time. That is, we can predict the value of the Hubble constant to 1%, again, with those assumptions. So it just seems uh, that this is really the ultimate test. We ought to go out and measure the Hubble constant to 1% precision and see if all of these understandings really hold. And so that's what we tried to do starting about 10 years ago, was we developed a program to try to approach 1%, primarily because we were interested in dark energy, that particular assumption. Uh, for that particular assumption, uh, if you have good cosmic microwave background data, then the uncertainty in the equation of state of dark energy will go roughly like twice the uncertainty in the Hubble constant. So getting to percent level would be a lot of improvement. So, Many great astronomers have banged their head against the Hubble constant for years. Uh, how would we get to percent level when it was so hard before? Well, we saw a route to doing this shortly after the end of the HST Keep project, and I'll talk more about that as I go. But just to sort of give you a, a bird's eye view of it, we thought if we built a, a clean, simple ladder, so this would just be geometry, Cepheids, and supernovae, we thought we had the best chance for reaching this goal. Um, we saw ways that we could reduce past dominant systematic errors in previous measurements by different ways of collecting the data. And I hope to explain those as I go along in the talk. Um, and also, it was important to very thoroughly propagate the statistical and systematic errors in all the steps simultaneously so we could have a realistic error bar if we were going to really compare to the cosmic microwave background. And uh, I'll show you how we did that later on. So here's the route that we built, and this is sort of a, a cartoon, so it's not exactly to proportion or exactly right. But the general idea is at the kiloparsec scale is where, with parallax, one can use geometry to calibrate Cepheids. Uh, at the megaparsec scale, this is where you could find galaxies that hosted type 1a supernovae, but where you can still see Cepheids with the Hubble Space Telescope, and so you could calibrate those supernovae. And at the gigaparsec scale, where supernovae are out in the Hubble flow, and once calibrated and with knowledge of their redshifts, you could determine the Hubble constant. So um, first, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to go through these three steps and improvements that have been made in all of them. First, let me tell you about improvements in our ability to measure parallax to individual Milky Way Cepheids. Um, Many of you, most of you, probably maybe even none of you have ever actually seen parallax with your naked eye. It's, the problem is stars are really far away. And so because they're far away, the angles are very small. And so all parallax measurements are really statistical, which is fine. That's how we do science. But wouldn't it be nice to actually see parallax with your eye? So I put together with some help uh, from uh, Kailash Sahu uh, a, an attempt to show you parallax with your eye. And the, what, what you do is you take the very nearest star, that helps, that gives you the biggest parallax, Proxima Centauri, so that should have an arc second of parallax. And you take the optical telescope with the best resolution, which is HST's Wide Field Camera 3. Okay, that's good. So now you have the best resolution, the biggest motions, and you look at a series of pictures and you will see right away, you can decompose the motion into two motions. One is the proper motion moving off in this direction, and the other is the parallax motion. And uh, even uh, 
uh, here, you can see that, you can actually see with your eye, ah, yes, there is parallax. Stars actually do move in this way. Um, but of course, mostly we're dealing with uh, parallaxes of interest are, you know, a factor of a thousand times smaller th uh, than this, the motion, and that's when life starts to get hard. So why does life get hard when you try to measure that well? Well, it actually comes down to how well you can measure the position of a star, how well you can centroid a star. Um, one of the, again, the best telescopes for centroiding stars is a telescope where you understand the point spread function very well, so you could fit that well. Um, so on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we can determine the position of a star to about one one hundredth of a pixel. That's the best we can do. Uh, part of the problem is you can't get infinite signal to noise. These detectors saturate at some point, so that limits that. Um, this is pixelated information, but nevertheless, you can get to about a hundredth of a pixel. But if you wanted to measure parallaxes of Cepheids, which are mostly a kiloparsecs away, that's good enough for a two sigma detection of parallax. So that's just not very good. Um, so uh, a bunch of us realized a few years ago that if instead we spatially scan the telescope while we made the observation, that instead of just having one point source to compare to another point source, you can have a whole line of sources to compare to another line. And if you match those in time, pixel by pixel, you could really reduce the errors. You could reduce them largely because of statistics, but also because of sampling different parts of the focal plane. Um, and something else I'll show you in a minute. If you're confused about what I'm saying, uh, this is what we actually do. We observe the stars go screaming by and we produce frames that look like a series of vertical lines that you can then measure exceedingly well the separation between those lines perpendicular to the scans. You basically give up knowledge or even trying to measure along the direction of scan. That works well for parallax because you know the orientation of the ellipse on the sky. So here's what an actual patch of an image looks like. You see lots of lines, little dots you see are cosmic rays. Those obviously are not going through the optics but are easy enough to find and uh, filter out. Um, you then go and line by line, you fit a cross section of the point spread function to determine the position of the star each mini row by mini row. And once you've done that, you align them in time. And one of the first things you notice is that what looks like noise is the same in all of the stars. It's not noise at all. It's the jitter of the telescope. The telescope has solid body motion in the direction perpendicular to the scan. That's fine because you only care about the separation between two stars. So when you subtract one star from another, the jitter goes away. So that's a big improvement over even direct imaging. And you get to average over thousands of pixels. So we quickly saw we could get down to 25 micro arc seconds, which is a really uh, phenomenal precision uh, just by using this kind of technique. Um, now, uh, it's taken us a few years because we also learned that there were a lot of calibrations that we had to do uh, to deal with this, with, to deal with other issues that come up at this level. We're trying to measure down to one millipixel, a thousandth of a pixel. Now, staring mode gets you to, as I said, a hundredth of a pixel. The statistics of scanning will get you to a thousandth of a pixel. And the thing you're trying to measure, parallax at two kiloparsecs, you need that precision. But things that came and that we had to calibrate and were not previously in the calibration pipeline for HST, intra-scan velocity aberration, variable jitter, intra-scan rotations, which occur when you uh, use the fine guidance sensors to try to go in a straight line, but you actually go in a rotated line, um, intra-scan distortions, breathing of the telescope, that changes. Um, and you have to deal with all of these in order to get there. So we feel like we have at this point, and so this shows you after a few years of observations, this is a field of stars. Uh, every data point you see for a given star is an observation six months later. We fit and subtracted the proper motion. So what you see, this, this looks like a series of W's or V's back and forth. That's the parallax motion. Um, it's quite easy to see once you get down to these 20 or 30 micro arc second uncertainties. Here is a Cepheid variable uh, that we measured. Uh, and this one turns out to be about three kiloparsecs away. We've measured that to 27 micro arc second precision, um, and this after four years. And so we're now up to about 10 of these, and this will be very useful for calibrating the luminosity of Cepheids. Now, I also want to point out there have been other very good ways to calibrate the luminosity of Cepheids, some of them done here. Uh, this famous galaxy NGC 4258, the Mega Maser system, where 
water mazers are in Keplerian motion has been tracked by uh, Jim Moran's radio group for about a decade or a decade and a half. The distance to this is now good to 2.6%, and HST observations of Cepheids in that galaxy give you the calibration information. Also, uh, detached eclipsing binary systems uh, can be done purely geometrically uh, and have been done much better over the last decade by uh, Petrinsky's group. Um, so the distance to the LMC is now known to about 2% this way as well. And then in the future, I'm going to say more uh, about Gaia. That will come up in a little bit. Okay. So that's step one, the geometric calibration. We have new parallaxes. We have these other great um, NGC 4258 and things like this. That's going to really continue to improve. Step two are these handful of galaxies where you can see Cepheids and that had type 1a supernovae. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the main reasons it was built was to be able to observe Cepheids in uh, secondary distance indicator galaxies. This is like supposed to be the bread and butter for HST. The problem was the first successful camera on HST with PIC2 was not a great camera for this. It had fat pixels, a tenth of an arc second. It had low quantum efficiency. So you can only see Cepheids out to about 20 megaparsecs. And there are a very few type 1a supernovae. And only like once a decade do you get a type 1a supernova that close. And so that forced people to go back and pull out these old photographic plates from 1937 and try to calibrate those, which was very difficult to do. This changed dramatically in the last 10 years when the astronauts put in the advanced camera with smaller pixels and better sensitivity, and now wide field camera three. Um, so we can now go out to about 40 or 50 uh, megaparsecs. So that's double the range, it's eight times the volume. So now there's a good type 1a supernova eh, once every year or two. So we've been able to collect about 19 of these, and these are all modern type 1a supernovae observed with the same instruments used to observe those in the Hubble flow. So here are the period luminosity relations for the Cepheids in each of these galaxies observed in three filters, in uh, visual, infrared, and the near-infrared H-band, uh, as well as these four anchor galaxies uh, that uh, I talked about, uh, M31 and the LMC, where you can use the detached eclipsing binaries, the Milky Way, where you go right to trigonometric parallax, 4258 with the uh, Mega Maser, all very different. Now, one of the ways we have been able to reduce systematic errors over past measurements of the Hubble constant is you recognize that a distance ladder really involves observing the same kind of object in two locations. And if it's a standard candle, you want to observe it with the same telescope, the two different locations, because then zero-point uncertainties will really drop out. But that's, that was not done in the past. Typically, people would use a smaller ground-based telescope for the nearby objects and then use HST, and then they'd have to understand the difference in the calibration. So we, for the first time, started making all the measurements with the same telescope instrument filters so that we could compare without knowledge of the zero point. So I'm showing you here the stacked Cepheids, uh, the light curves of 2400 in each of these individual galaxies, including the anchor galaxies that we observe with HST. We also observe Cepheids over the same range of periods and galaxies with the same metallicities. We measure the metallicity gradients of each galaxy. So the homogeneity of the Cepheids used across the distance ladder, both in measurements and in qualities, is really important for reducing the systematic errors. Um, I want to show you one new capability of HST. This is just something we were able to do just a month ago, um, which is there's a new capability called DASH. If you've ever observed with the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, it has a very small field of view, and you can only observe things in that field of view, uh, and uh, therefore it takes you an orbit to collect each object uh, for objects that are spread over, let's say, a degree. So if you know you had 20 objects spread over a degree, you'd need 20 orbits. Well, with the new DASH capability, you uh, drop to gyro guiding uh, instead of you locking on the FGS, and you move over to those, and you can take short exposures. If you observe in the near infrared, you can actually take a series of frames, and you could even combine them, even if there is drift. And as a result, we found we can hit 24 targets in a single orbit. And so uh, for the Large Magellanic Cloud, which has lots of Cepheids, we were able to observe these with HST. Here's a period luminosity relation for um, 
this is, you know, what Henrietta Leavitt was looking at, uh, but not with this kind of fidelity, um, in just two orbits of the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, I've, this is a little film, a little uh, set of 2D images I've just aligned uh, in period, and you can actually see the period luminosity relationship just by looking at these images. Um, this is even without any corrections or anything. It's just a, a very high precision measurement that can be done now with HST and its great stability in very little time. Um, okay, the other big advantage over what's been done before is uh, past measurements of the Hubble constant used optical observations. We've done this in the near infrared using the, the H band on HST. Near infrared is good because it allows you to cut through uh, the extinction and it also lowers sensitivity to metallicity. Um, so, for example, in M31, the most famous galaxy for Cepheid observations, Cepheid, uh, Hubble's most famous Cepheid, um, the direct team that was here uh, found many Cepheids in M31. Here are the period luminosity relations as seen from the ground. They're pretty ratty in the VNI, partly because of crowding partly because of differential extinction. Here is the same objects primarily now seen with HST from the FAT survey, uh, but in the near infrared. And you see you get nice tight period luminosity relation. Even at random phases, you get a much better result because you cut down on the crowding and you remove the differential extinction. Okay, the third step is easy. This is easy because so much work has been done at various places, especially at the CFA, of measuring the supernovae in the Hubble flow. So here's 300 type 1a supernovae in the Hubble flow that you used to measure the intercept of the Hubble diagram. And we account for changes in the expansion due to deceleration or acceleration or even jerk. We go out to uh, Q naught and J naught, which are measured from higher redshift supernovae. So we can keep this all within uh, a supernova measurement from that. Um, now, we do the analysis simultaneously in one step. In the past, people would kind of fit each of these relations and carry on the information but lose the covariance. And so the way we've done this, we have a lot of nuisance parameters that we fit out. At the end of the day, we're using measurements of Cepheids and supernova hosts, Cepheids and anchors, supernovae, and geometric distance priors, uh, a series of nuisance parameters, a series of simultaneous equations to determine two things, the fiducial luminosity of a type 1a supernova and the intercept of its Hubble diagram tells you the Hubble constant. Um, so when we do that, you can actually, this isn't how we do it, but I can show you the best fit result is actually this distance ladder, one continuous set of distance measurements uh, from local to far away. And so these are basically the three steps where you go from geometry to calibrate Cepheids, and this is done with 15 Milky Way parallaxes and three other anchors, the LMC, M31, and 4258. And then, once geometry calibrates Cepheids, the Cepheids can now calibrate supernovae. So there are 19 of these, and uh, these have a pretty big range from about four magnitudes, uh, and they have the same scatter, which is important, as what we see for these 300 that are used to measure the Hubble flow. So the answer we get at the end of the day, 70. 3.24 plus or minus 1.74. So that's a 2.4% uh, uncertainty. Um, now, over time, we've been able to attack various sources in the error budget. This is showing you how this has improved since this was the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project, their final results, Friedman et al. in 2001, and then how we were able to reduce these over the last few years through uh, various uh, iterations of this using different cameras uh, and whatnot. So our current error budget is now dominated by two terms, which I'll talk more about. The small sample, when you have 19 objects calibrating 300, naturally the statistics of the 19 are going to dominate. So that's this purple number here. And knowledge of the absolute geometric distance is still one that limits us. So let me say uh, a little bit more. But first, let's compare it to the cosmic microwave background, because of course that was the whole purpose. And this is where things get quite interesting, I think. Um, so here is uh, the measurement that I've been talking about up till now. And here is the claimed best measurement from the cosmic microwave background in concert with this vanilla Lambda CDM model that I talked about. I think formally this number is 66.9 or 67.0 plus or minus 0.6. The, the uncertainty on this is much smaller than our uncertainty. So formally, this is about 3.4 sigma apart when you use both of their errors together and treat them as uncorrelated as, as they are. Um, now, the preceding before our measurements, the best 
non-type 1a supernova measurements of the Hubble constant are sort of this set here, which the average of which are in good agreement with what we see. Um, now, I think both groups have spent a lot of, both the Planck group and the, our group, have spent a lot of time in trying to track down and consider systematic errors. This has been going on for many years, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about those coming up. But at this point in time, after, as I said, many, oops, uh, years of consideration of this, I think we also have to start thinking of what could be going on if we accept this at face value, if there is not, you know, a systematic error that's going to arise. Um, and there are lots of possible extensions of cosmology that could go in this direction. Uh, for example, if dark energy is weird, uh, if it has an equation of state of less than minus uh, m less than minus one. Now, the length of the arrow for each of these are the size of this term that would not do violence to some other measurement, some other constraint we have. So, for example, you could shift the dark energy equation of state by 0.1, and you'd be at about the two sigma level in terms of being uh, up against, you know, baryon acoustic oscillations or high redshift supernovae, and it wouldn't even get you all the way there. You could change the derivative of dark energy, have it becoming more negative. Again, this is sort of the, the two-ish sigma, wouldn't quite get you all there. Um, dark radiation, a number of people uh, in this audience, Cord Horkin, others have written papers about this. You don't need an integer number. I mean, you may need an integer actual number of particles, but the effect it has is actually a fraction because it depends when it decouples and at what temperature it decouples. So uh, uh, 0.4 is a very natural amount, uh, is also true for Goldstone bosons. Uh, so something like that would not do particular violence and would get you pretty much all the way there. Curvature that won't help all that much. You can't really get away with too much curvature. Um, and so that doesn't help all that much. Uh, dark matter radiation interaction in the early universe would also act to shift the sound horizon in much the same way that dark radiation would. So these are the kind of possibilities. Uh, to quote the Planck team, if a persuasive case can be made that a direct measurement of H not conflicts with these estimates, then it will be strong evidence for additional physics. So um, is this uh, a persuasive case? Well, maybe not quite yet, but we're getting there. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about why I think uh, in some cases it is. Um, for our measurement to be wrong, to be wrong at one of these three steps, uh, if it were all in one of these three steps, we'd have to be off by about two-tenths of a magnitude in terms of our photometry. That's a really big number. Um, I mean, this is easier than what we were doing in 1998 when we were measuring high redshift supernovae to low redshift supernovae because this is all done in the rest frame. You don't actually have to deal with what astronomers call K-corrections or relativistic corrections um, or even the thought of evolution. I mean, this is all low redshift uh, you know, same telescopes, and so two-tenths of a magnitude is enormous. You know, could we be off by a hundredth of a magnitude? Yeah, but I, I, I don't see how we could possibly be off by that much, and you could see it in the data as well. Um, now, we have considered many variants of the analysis, about 23 variants of the analysis. We have varied the rending law, the way we treat metallicity, which supernova light curve fitter we use, what range we sample the Hubble flow over. Uh, we've changed uh, which host type of galaxy we will consider, um, a possible breaks in the period luminosity relationship that people have suggested, uh, different ranges that are, are better than other ranges, uh, different ways of doing the outlier analysis. And this gray histogram represents those 23 variants. And you could see that we're really dominated by the statistical error, not the, not the variance error. And we never can get down, no matter what we try, down to something, you know, below about 71. Um, and so, uh, and this shows you sort of the values you get from uh, the different individual anchors. Now, one thing that people ask me about a lot, so I thought I'd have a special slide on this, is could it somehow be that the local Hubble expansion or bubble that we live in is somehow different than the global, okay? Well, about that I can say that, uh, first of all, uh, we account for the flows expected from structures around us. That is, we use redshift surveys like two M, uh, the two mass plus plus uh, density field to predict velocity corrections, and we apply those to all objects. That means we're taking out the peculiar or coherent flows that you would know about, that you would expect. And we also, as I said, use Q naught and J naught to correct for changes in that. So we're talking really about is there something we're missing beyond 
what you would expect from giant redshift surveys in terms of flows. So then we can explore this empirically by starting our measurement of the local expansion rate and making it uh, not local, but more and more global by going out further and further. You see, we're measuring expansion in an annulus with an inner radius and an outer radius. The inner radius is about 0.02 and the outer radius is about 0.15. However, we can change the definition of the inner radius and outer radius continuously, as you see here. So this is the minimum and the maximum Z is the minimum plus 0.15. So as you move, you see fluctuations. By the time you get to uh, about here, you are now using supernovae that were not at all correlated with supernovae here because you've completely moved beyond the set. And also you've increased the volume from about 1.6 cubic gigaparsecs to eventually 10. You do see fluctuations. The fluctuations are about the half a percent level. Now this matches well what n-body simulations expect. There's this series of uh, simulations by Oderskov et al. that uh, in a 700 cubic megaparsec box, varied the position of the observer and found variations would be expected in the Hubble constant of about 0.3%. So yeah, variations at 0.3%, 0.5%. Planck plus lambda CDM value would have to be down here. So again, we're just very, very far away from this systematic causing that. Um, now, since our paper came out a year ago, I want to show you some updates that are also kind of interesting. So this was the results I just showed you. And then um, there was a reanalysis by the Swiss group. They took all our raw data and remeasured the Hubble constant using different statistical techniques. It was a kind of fancy hierarchical Bayesian analysis. And they got 73.6 plus or minus 1.5. So that suggests we didn't make a stupid math error. Um, the holy cow lensing team, these three strong lens systems, um, yeah, it's a good acronym. Uh, they, uh, this is uh, Roger Blanford and Sherry Suyu, Tommaso Treo, Chris Fosnacht, and others um, have now measured three of these systems, and they get a result that's very consistent with ours. Um, this other group uh, used our data to measure tip of the red giant branch as an alternative distance indicator to Cepheids. This is the uh, group from Korea, Jang and Lee. They can only do this for six of the 19 galaxies because tip of the red giant branch is a lot fainter than Cepheids. However, uh, we can match that and use the same six they used and they use the same two anchors that they use. So using exactly the same objects, uh, the result between tip of the red giant branch versus Cepheids is extremely similar. So this is a, a pretty powerful test that there's not a problem with Cepheids. Um, and then, this was very exciting, uh, a few months ago, um, Gaia released their first release of parallax measurements. Now, the first round of parallaxes have much lower precision than they plan eventually to get to. These are just 0.3 milli arc seconds. However, they have them over the whole sky. So we were able to take 200 Milky Way Cepheids from Gaia and throw away all the anchors that we've used. Throw away our parallax measurements, NGC 4258, the LMCs attached to eclipsing binary, and replace it with this. And we got 73 plus or minus two. This took like a day because, you know, if all you, once you have the set of numbers, there's nothing else to change. You just slide this in. And so we could see that we're, get, we're, we're really hanging here at this with lots of cross checks along the way from other experiments that uh, this seems to be sticking. Um, however, then I picked up the New York Times, which I read every day, and uh, it said, uh, hey, this is interesting, and these odds might sound good in poker, but not in physics, which requires odds of one in a million, meaning five sigma. And that is certainly uh, a good point, that uh, you know, three and a half sigma with cross checks is one thing, but how can we do this much better? Because after all, the comparison is limited by our error bar, not Planck's error bar. Um, and so, uh, I just want to quickly, in the end here, show you what we see as the path to the future to get to 1%. And it can be seen pretty simply. Uh, you see these three steps. This is about the total error that comes from each of these steps, which get added. So to get to 1%, this step is done, basically. I mean, we're already at 0.4%. Um, improvements there would be nice, and systematics are things you always worry about. But in terms of statistics, you know, this is the problem are these two steps. So let me tell you about these two steps. This is the first step, the geometric calibration. Now, when Gaia has its full results, okay, um, it can get this to 1.5%. Now, you'd think you'd do much better, but there's a problem which can be rectified by using Gaia and HST together, which will get you to 0.4%. Let me explain uh, how that would work here, okay? Here is the, the, 
the place where you would calibrate the luminosity of Cepheids by geometry. This is the period luminosity relationship for Milky Way Cepheids. And so what I show here in, I don't know, it came out yellow here. Um, these 10 are the ones that we have measured with this new scanning technique with HST. And they came out quite well, about as you, well as you would expect, but there's only 10 of them. Um, but good enough for a 3% cross check of the result. Now, Gaia DR1 error bars are much bigger than ours. We're, we're doing better than Gaia at the moment because Gaia is just getting started, okay? Um, however, Gaia will eventually have error bars like this, which will be much smaller than ours. And they will have it for many Cepheids, these 200 some Cepheids. So we picked 50 of the longest period Cepheids because they're the best analogs to extragalactic Cepheids. And we began observing those with HST. And the reason is because when you try to measure the luminosity of a Cepheid, you actually need two things. You need a parallax measurement, but you also need a photometric measurement. And you want to do that with the same telescope that you're using for the extragalactic Cepheids. Otherwise, you'll lose all this wonderful precision that will come from the Gaia parallax measurements. So we began doing this because the Cepheids are bright, you have to avoid saturation. So we've been using ultra rapid scanning. We're going at the fastest speed we can go, seven and a half arc seconds per second, which is a, effectively an exposure time of 0.01 seconds, very reliable there. And so this is what we're doing. You see these very rapid scans. These are the Cepheids. And then we simultaneously monitor the light curves from the ground so we know what phase we're at. But it's the, the HST data which will zero point this. So these red points you see are multiple epochs where we've done this with HST, and they agree very well, but they allow us to zero point on the HST system. So in the future, this is a simulation, but it's a, a, a high fidelity simulation in that it matches everything we know. These are the 50 Cepheids we've observed with HST with this rapid spatial scanning, and using the periods they're at and the errors expected from Gaia from the final results, you will get something like this, which really will get you down to about 0.4 so this will be fantastic and will really knock out that, that first rung. So then we're finally left with that middle rung, the number of galaxies where we observe supernovae and Cepheids. This is still limited by the number of local supernovae that are known. So what I show here is this is the number of type 1a supernovae known as a function of distance. And obviously, when you're down here in the low volume, there's very few. This is why it was so difficult with HST and with PIC2. Uh, if you're only within 20 megaparsecs, there aren't many. Here's where we are now. Um, we can go out to about 50 megaparsecs, and we've observed 19. And this is what the uncertainty in the Hubble constant is as a function of how many you do. And so uh, we have an uncertainty here of 1.3%. Um, if we can do all of the ones that are possible, that would take us up to about 50, in the lifetime of HST, um, then we could get this term to about 0.85%. This would take about 450 orbits, which... You know, HST has 3,000 orbits a year. We expect it to last another five to 10 years. So that's, you know, somewhere between 50 to 30,000 orbits. So, you know, if anybody is out there in the TAC, uh, you know, 450 is not a crazy, <laughs> crazy request. Um, and if we can get there, oh, yes, this was also a strong recommendation of the Gaia pre launch workshop. If we can get there, then we can knock this term down and we can get to a total uncertainty of about 1%. That would be a very powerful tool for uh, cosmology. In fact, looking ahead, so this would be around the year 2022 with, I wrote 60, but maybe 50 uh, supernova hosts. Um, this was uh, a conclusion from uh, this uh, dark energy um, summary uh, written by uh, Dan Eisenstein, uh, Dave Weinberg, and myself, and others, um, that having knowledge of the Hubble constant at the 1% level is still very interesting to stage 3, stage 4, even going up to when there is Euclid and W first and LSST, you still get about a factor of, it's like doubling your data set. You get a factor of 40% improvement in the dark energy figure of merit. So this would be a nice thing to do. It would also be a very strong complement to CMB stage 4. Uh, this is discussed in Manzati et al. Of course, we have to keep staying alert for systematics along the way, um, but I think this is something that's feasible and, and no more difficult than many of the future experiments that are being proposed, and so it's something I think we should go after. So uh, I'm going to end there with, with some uh, takeaways and take any questions that you have.
Okay, question. Please. Uh, supposedly with JWST you can increase the radius where you can reach set by a factor of five. Uh, how difficult would it be to cross code JWST and HC? Right. Uh, so the question was, could you use JWST to go out further? One of the challenges, JWST is really uh, near infrared optimized, and uh, we usually discover sepias in the optical because they have light curves that have large amplitudes in the optical, about a magnitude, a magnitude and a half. So if JWST doesn't have better than expected blue side performance, and I don't expect it to, then um, we're not really going to be able to find sepias with JWST out further. You could follow them up if you knew where they were, but um, so I don't think JWST will be very helpful for this. <coughs> Others? Yes. So the middle rung is the one with the most uncertainty. Um, there's just a few supernovae there. Are you worried at all that there could be a mixture of progenitors in that mid range, that there could be some that are coming from double degenerate, <coughs> some from single degenerate, that right. might have different sequences? Right. So we have done the exercise of limiting the supernovae uh, in, th in this sample uh, to this, to, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, so these are all essentially late type galaxies because they're targets of cepheids. Uh, about two thirds of these are late type galaxies, about a third are early types. So we've done the exercise of eliminating all the early type galaxies. So now it's only late type to late type. Um, and so those are the kinds of things you can do. Uh, I can't think of any reason, I mean, what is, special within 40 megaparsecs that you would have type 1a supernovae when they go off in late type galaxies they're double degenerate and when they go off beyond 40 megaparsecs in late type galaxies they're single degenerate or something like that. I also uh, believe that the light curve shape corrections that we make are things that account for those kinds of differences even though we don't yet understand you know which are which but um, basically you know because this sample is so much bigger than this sample, you could always reselect uh, a sample here that mimic this sample any way that you can define an important property. Pardon? No, I'm sure the Planck team uh, uh, say they're completely correct in their analysis, but yes. are you convinced by the All right, so now I'm going to show you the one slide that uh, <laughs> get, I, I'll throw a little. Mm, Dirt in that direction. Um, so this is, this is not my work, but uh, this uh, uh, group, Addison, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, came out with a paper uh, about a year ago after our results saying, you know, when they look at the Hubble constant in the two halves, so here's the Planck data. So they measure the, you know, the power spectrum here of the cosmic microwave background at a whole range of L's that from, you know, uh, this is chunky and this is fine. And if you divide this data in half and say, what Hubble constant do you get from this half? What Hubble constant do you get from this half? So the answer is, from this half, you get a Hubble constant that's high, around 70. From this half, you get a Hubble constant that is low, about 64. So obviously, when you bring both sets together, the answer is 67, which is what they're reporting. But to Addison, this looked like significant tension at about the 2.5 sigma level. Now, the, so that's a concern if you wonder if there's some kind of systematic here. Now, the Planck team responded by saying, yeah, well, you know, there's actually six parameters in the cosmological model. Anytime you split your data and you look at uh, the differences amongst six things and you pick the one that's the most extreme, then uh, you will see something a little more than uh, you know, less than two sigma, and so they said this effect of that's two and a half sigma is really like 1.8 sigma in the context of six parameters. But other people, certainly myself, I would say I disagree with that because we were focused on the Hubble constant because we saw this tension. We didn't look at the other five parameters and attempt to measure those. So I think it, this really is a difference between you know a posteriori versus a priori statistics, and this was an a priori test, I think. So I don't know. I, I guess the if you're arguing about two and a half versus 1.8 sigma, you should get better data. <laughs> so this, given the discrepancy and also the possibility of local bubbles, what's the prospect of whether it's valuable to measure bubble counts in different directions? Is that, is that a useful thing to do? Right, um, in different directions. Right. Be your people, data. right, people have looked at that. We've done these measurements, and generally we don't see differences in that way. We also have surveys from the south and surveys from the north, and we get the same Hubble constant from those, from the like the Kalantaloa survey in the south, 
or the CFA surveys in the north, um, ESDSS, which did a certain strip, strip 82, same mobile constant, strip 82. Um, so unless somebody has a very specific model, I, I can just tell you that you know variations there are at the few tenths of a percent level, not what we're seeing. Total change of pace. You showed a picture of the small, of the large Magellanic cloud for the calibration of the uh, Cepheid variables there. Right. And I was wondering why you didn't indicate that what the effect of the spread over the distances to the various Cepheid variables in the large Magellanic cloud. It seemed to me it just went too fast. I didn't really get a chance. You mean the front to back? Yeah. Right. Um, we haven't modeled that yet. As I, as I said, we just got that data about a month ago. And so I just did the, the simple thing of applying with the period luminosity relationship. Here it is. But I can already tell you we're down to about, the scatter here is about six hundredths of a magnitude. So that's you know less than 3% in distance. But yeah, you're right. If, if we, we can use knowledge of the orientation of it and the positions, and presumably we could reduce the scatter a little bit more, which would be helpful. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Scott, did you? So, I mean, as I'm sure you know, there are four uh, studies going on for possible missions to be presented from the to the Decadal Survey, um, two of which are uh, going to have uh, optical infrared cameras uh, on larger apertures than HST. It seems like uh, the largest source of uncertainty after Gaia will still be the middle one of this ladder. Yes. So how important are, do you think that those, kind of, with those kinds of missions, what would they contribute to Yes, this? they'd be tremendously important because you would just go out and you know collect hundreds of these things. I mean, if you got to the point where you had you know 300 in that, in that essentially the middle rung, like you have 300 on the distant one, you can get, I mean, you can start talking about a Hubble constant to half a percent. And then you just get to the sharper part of the curves that I was showing you using uh, that kind of prior would be fantastic. So I think that would be great. I mean, I don't want to say JWC can't help at all. It's just you're not getting the full improvement because by moving so far to the red, um, the the it's hard to detect these as variable stars. Of course, there are other kinds of stars. People may develop a little more with, um, you know, I've been working some on Myra's. Uh, you know, I know people have been looking at TRGB. The problem with TRGB just is it's a couple of magnitudes fainter than Cepheids, and our main problem is getting out further. Um, and so I, I think generally you want star-based distance indicators that are not fainter than Cepheids, but are, Myra's, at least in the near infrared, are brighter. To follow up with TRGB, uh, for Cepheids, you need, the, you need resolution and phase and with TRGB, you can just stare and collapse, so you can go deeper, presumably. That's true, but two and a half magnitudes is a lot of coax. I mean, you know, you can get 12 exposures and do Cepheids, and you can stack those 12 exposures and still be, you know, magnitude and a half shy. Okay, well, let's thank Adam again. <laughs>